We've seen that God is complex in his unity. We've seen that there is nothing idolatrous in terms of what the New Testament teaches as to how the Son is divine and makes the Father known. But still, there is the question of, well, if, if you say you worship Jesus, isn't all worship supposed to go to God? And aren't you confusing it? And if he was physically here, would we worship him? And aren't you worshiping flesh and blood? So people can get confused about that. What I want you to see scripturally is that worship of Yeshua is always worship of God. That acknowledging who he is is always to the glory of God. There's no separation. There's no competition. One friend of mine, an Orthodox rabbi, has often pressed this. He said, he's a dear man. I don't question his devotion. I would say he's obviously very wrong and missing things in a very profound way. But just as Paul wrote Romans 10 about his own people having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, I would see the same about this very precious ultra-Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And in his mind, there can be no competition, no competition for the worship and adoration that goes to God and God alone. So anything that detracts from it, distracts from it, anything secondary, any, anything that, that is in any way in competition with the worship of God is now dividing one's heart and taking worship that belongs only to an uncreated being and giving it to a created being. I understand this perspective, except it's totally false. The Son of God is not created. He is uncreated. He comes into this world and pitches his tent among us. We don't worship the physical tent. We don't have the physical flesh and blood. We don't even have depictions from the first believers about what Yeshua looked like because he transcended that. That's not the issue, but all worship of him is worship of God. Now, now look at this, Matthew, the 15th chapter. As, as the sick are healed by Yeshua, what's the result? Verses 30 and 31, and they praise the God of Israel. As a result of being healed, where does the praise go? It goes straight to the God of Israel. Luke 5, 26, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God when they saw the wonders that Yeshua was working. Luke 19, when he came near the place, verse 37, where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Yeshua taught in Matthew 5, 16, that as our light shines before people, that they will see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. He wanted us to demonstrate through our lives later in Matthew 5, that we are sons of our Father in heaven, and he sets the goal to be perfect as is our Father in heaven. And on and on, he teaches us to pray to our Heavenly Father. This is the, the pattern of prayer to our Heavenly Father, that his name would be glorified. He, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. This is not some distraction. This is the direct route. This is the direct connection. We can go on and on through the New Testament, but we'll, we'll see over and again, the great theme is this, that Yeshua comes into this world and suffers and dies for the glory of God, that he brings us out of sin into the family of God to the glory of God. It even says in Philippians, the second chapter, that one day every knee will bow to him and every tongue confess, and it's quoting from Isaiah 5, that every tongue will confess that Yahweh is God, every knee will bow to him, here it's applied to Jesus, and it says it is to the glory of God the Father. Again, think of him, as I said in the last lecture, think of him as, as a divine magnet coming down into this world and drawing out from human beings, masses of human beings all around the world, praise, adoration, honor, worship to God and to God alone. And that's why we see in 1 Corinthians 15 that at the end it says the Son will be subject to the Father, that God may be all in all. That's why as we saw in, in a couple of classes back in Revelation chapter 22, that the final picture of God and the Lamb is that His servants see His face, not their faces, His face, one God. And they serve Him, not serve them. And His name, not their names, are written on their foreheads, one God revealed to us through the Son. What about the Holy Spirit? What about the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit, of course, is mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures, but Jewish tradition would understand the Holy Spirit as God's power, as, as, an, as an aspect of God's being, but not in any way as a separate entity. Certainly not, quote, the third person of the Trinity. 
What I want to show you is what the New Testament says about the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew. What the New Testament says about the Holy Spirit is in exact harmony with what the Hebrew Scriptures say about the Holy Spirit. And it's clear that He is a person versus just being a power. The Spirit can be described as poured out. The Spirit can be likened to wind. The Spirit can be likened to water. And yet the Spirit Himself is a distinct personality. So let, let's just look at, at some verses speaking of the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew Scriptures. Psalm 106, verses 32 and 33. When the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness, they sinned against God's Spirit. Quote, by the waters of Merivah, they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them, for they rebelled against the Spirit of God. What does that mean? See, see, the Spirit's the one that's working among them. The Spirit's the one that's interacting among the people. Does, does God get off His heavenly throne, so to say? No. Does He stop filling the universe? No. Is He being seen in a visible way? That's through the sun? No. But He sees working among us. That's why... The people rebelled against the Spirit. That's, that's not a power, that's a person. You don't rebel against an abstract power. Look at this, Isaiah 63, 10. Yet they rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit. Interesting. You don't grieve a wall. You don't grieve a rock. You don't grieve the wind. You don't grieve a power. You grieve a person. They grieved His Holy Spirit, so He turned and became their enemy, and He Himself fought against them. Micah 2, 7 raises the question of whether the Spirit of the Lord can become impatient. Look at this, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. Again, not an impersonal force or power, but an aspect of God, and yet somehow a separate being, a separate person, and, and yet God, not, not some other entity, when we speak of His complex unity or His triunity, this makes perfect sense. Uh, we see in other passages, Psalm 104, God gave His Spirit to the Israelites to instruct them. So the Spirit teaches. The psalmist prays in Psalm 51, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So if I ask you the question, is the Spirit of God God. Well, well, yes, and yet it says God gave His Spirit. So it's part of Him, it's an extension of Him, and yet it's Him. Isaiah 63, beginning in verse 11, speaking back to the days of Moses, it asks this question, where is He who set His Holy Spirit among them? He set His Holy Spirit among them. This is how He worked in His power. It says, like a horse in open country, they did not stumble. Like cattle that goes down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. According to Nehemiah 9, 19, and 20, it's by the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God, rather, was the one who was manifest in the cloud by day and by the fire by night. According to Psalm 139, God dwells among us, by, measure, by means of His Spirit. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I run from your Spirit? See, that's God's presence working among us. The Son reveals. The Son reveals the Father. When people have an encounter, when Abraham encounters Yahweh and two angels in Genesis 18, when, when Aaron and, and Nadav and Avihu and Moses and the 70 elders see God in Exodus 24, who are they seeing? They're seeing the Son. The Son is the one who makes them know. The Spirit is the presence working among us. We use the illustration of the physical Sun, S-U-N, in the sky. That the, the core of it, the source of it, the very nucleus of it is, is, is so bright, so hot, we cannot see it. That's like the Father. What we see, the shining forth, that's like the Sun. And then the invisible rays that touch us and bring life to the world, that's like the Holy Spirit. One physical Son, complex in its unity. One true God, complex in its unity, except in a personal way. Uh, look at this. 2 Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. This is very personal. 1 Chronicles 28, 
11 and 12. It, it, it says that, that David gave Solomon the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms, and on and on. The, the detailed blueprint that David developed was put in his mind by the Spirit. The Spirit put words on his tongue. This is not an impersonal force. And God gives this Spirit to us. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Ezekiel, Ezekiel 11, and it says, And he told me to say, this is what Yahweh says, this is what the Lord says, Komar Adonai. What? The Spirit told me to say this. Now, when we get over to the New Testament, this is exactly what we see happening. The Holy Spirit speaking, the Holy Spirit instructing, the Holy Spirit leading, the Holy Spirit guiding. We can, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings forth fruit in our lives. Exactly what we see in the Hebrew Scriptures, with this one exception. There is a great increase in the Spirit's activity. Where do we get that from? Well, the prophecy in Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 28. Where, where God says, and after these things, which Peter in Acts 2 explains in, in these last days, that's when it's fulfilled. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. That part of the characteristic of the Messianic age is, is the outpouring of the spirit on all flesh. There's even a comment by the, the 10th century Jewish philosopher, Rav Sa'aja Gaon, that one of the marks of the Messianic era will be people prophesying. So, so we now have the inbreaking of the Messianic era through Yeshua coming into the world. Now, now here's what's fascinating. And, and uh, growing up Jewish, because I was not that religious, I was not familiar with the Jewish literature. So these things were things I learned and studied as, as I dug in over the years. But what's fascinating is, is that rabbinic literature... Rabbinic literature speaks of the Holy Spirit in personified form over and over and over in ways that seem just like the New Testament. Now, the, the traditional Jewish understanding would be it's just a personification. It's not meant to be taken literally, but it's quite fascinating. How about this? The Talmud states that when the elders performed the rite of the red heifer, they did not have to say, and the blood shall be forgiven them, Instead, the Holy Spirit announces to them, whenever you do this, the blood shall be forgiven to you. The Holy Spirit announces. Commenting on, on Exodus 1, the more the Israelites were oppressed by the Egyptians, the more they multiplied and spread, the Talmud states that the Holy Spirit announced to them, so will he, Israel, increase and spread out. Rashi, foremost medieval commentator, 11th century, foremost Jewish commentator of all time, explains this, and other major commentaries explain it to mean that the Holy Spirit said to the Egyptians, just as you seek to oppress them more, the more so will they increase and spread out. The Holy Spirit's speaking. Pirkei de Rabbi uh, Eliezer, which is, is, is uh, oh, about seven, eight hundred years after the New Testament, there may be some core of it that's, that's earlier, it says this, as Ishmael, Abraham's son, and Eliezer, his steward, uh, argue about who will be Abraham's heir, seeing that they're going together with Abraham to sacrifice Isaac to the Lord, the Holy Spirit answers them and says, neither this one nor this one will inherit. The Holy Spirit actually speaking. Uh, according to Leviticus Rabbah, so Midrash, the Holy Spirit is a defense counsel who speaks to Israel on behalf of the Lord, and then speaks to the Lord on behalf of Israel. To Israel, the Spirit says, do not testify against your neighbor without cause. And to the Lord, the Spirit says, do not say I'll do to him as he has done to me. So the Holy Spirit is an intercessor. We have that in Romans, the eighth chapter. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans that cannot be articulated in human speech. So when we look in the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit empowers, that He comes upon people, that He anoints, that He fills, that He reveals, that He leads, just like we have in the Hebrew Bible. Every one of those things are found in the Hebrew Scriptures as well. They're just found in pronounced measure now in the New Testament because the Holy Spirit has been poured out with the inbreaking of the Messianic Kingdom. The Holy Spirit speaks through the disciples just as the Spirit spoke through the prophets. And just as the rabbinic literature at times describes the Holy Spirit as speaking, saying, and communicating directly, the New Testament describes the exact same activity. 
The Holy Spirit is given to the believers in the New Testament, just as the Spirit was given to Moses and the elders. The Holy Spirit is poured out, just as Joel promised, and through the death and resurrection of Yeshua, the Spirit now lives within God's holy people as the prophets declared. The Holy Spirit teaches and is a counselor. The Spirit testifies to the truth about Messiah and leads his followers into all the truth. Just as David received instructions about the building of the temple through the Holy Spirit, so also Jesus the Messiah, after his resurrection, gave his disciples instructions through the Holy Spirit. So when we read these things, all this is doing is building on what's already in the Hebrew Scriptures. And this idea of the Holy Spirit as being God and yet a distinct person is found in the Hebrew Scriptures. And even, interestingly, in rabbinic literature, although the rabbis would tell us they understand things differently than what's written in the New Testament. Bottom line is this. There is nothing in the teaching of who Yeshua is as the Divine Son, nothing in the teaching of who the Holy Spirit is as the Divine Spirit, nothing written in the New Testament that contradicts the revelation of God in the Hebrew Scriptures, and nothing that in any way can be considered idolatrous, and nothing in any way that can be dis, uh, can taken to, to speak of God as being more than one person, like four gods or eight gods, three persons and one God, we're still speaking of one God. We're speaking of His complex unity, and there's nothing in this teaching whatsoever that's either idolatrous or contrary to what is written in the Hebrew Scriptures. And even, as we saw in the last lecture, there are rabbinic traditions that help us to understand this. Now, some have pointed to verses like Isaiah 43, 11, that God alone is our Savior. And so we don't need or recognize any other saviors. Well, the first thing is the word Moshiach can be used for an earthly person, Savior, Deliverer. That's used for earthly people in, in, in the Hebrew Bible. But here's the important thing. We're not looking to another Savior. We're not looking to some outside entity. We're not saying Jesus over here and God over here. We're saying, no, God comes into our world because He is the only Savior. God's the only one that can save. So, so we're not even looking to an earthly Messiah the way traditional Judaism is. Rather, we're looking to a divine Messiah, the very image of God in this world. This is what we need to understand in dealing with the question of the nature of God, a major, major theological issue. But there are many, many other theological objections. And some of them just say, look, you're, you're talking about two different religions. You're talking about two different expressions. And, and some would say that, that Christianity, let's put aside the theology of the nature of God and Trinity and Triunity and deity of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, all that. Some would say this, look, look, Christianity is the religion of the creed. Judaism is the religion of the deed. Christians are declared righteous by what they believe. Jews are declared righteous by what they do. Well, those are exaggerated statements. Let me ask you this. Does the biblical faith recognize the possibility of a God-denying Jew who could be righteous? Does traditional Judaism recognize the possibility of a Jew who denied God's oneness, who worshiped idols, or who was an atheist and said there is no God, that that person be, could be declared righteous? Of course not. Of course not. Why? Because before you, you do, before you act, you have to believe. That's why it says that when Abram believed in the Lord, Genesis 15, 6, when he believed in the Lord, it was counted to him for righteousness. That's why God revealed himself on Mount Sinai. This is who I am. Now, based on that, obey me. So faith is always going to precede works. Faith is going to come first and will be manifest in what we do. So it's an exaggeration to say that Judaism is the religion of the deed and Christianity is the religion of the creed as if the creed was not important in Judaism, as if there were not fundamentals of faith, as if a Jew did not recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, or hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
as if Jews did not recite that in a fundamental way and, and cling to it every day? And why is there such a battle over God's unity or triunity or the deity of Yeshua or things like that? Why is there such a battle if the creed is not important? Also, it's a complete misunderstanding of, quote, Christianity or the Messianic Jewish faith to simply say it's the religion of the creed. In point of fact, the New Testament says explicitly that faith without works is dead. We read that in Jacob, James, the second chapter. He says, like the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. First John, a great letter about what it really means to love God, says if, if you claim to, to love God whom you haven't seen, but don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you say that the love of God dwells in you? First John lays out plainly that if you claim to love God or know God, or walk in the light, and you do not live it out in a righteous life, you're a deceiver, you're a liar. Do you know throughout the New Testament, the proof of one's faith is seen in one's deeds. Yeshua teaches it in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Paul wrote it to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 9, 19. Yes, the Lord knows those who are his. This is this foundation. There's, there's heresy, there's unbelief, but this is the sure foundation. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Do you know in letter after letter, Paul warns his readers, in many cases, Gentile readers against being deceived. And he tells them, in 1 Corinthians 6, in Ephesians 5, in Galatians 5, in Colossians 3. He tells them that people who live in willful sin and disobedience, people who live in sexual immorality and won't repent, people who live in drunkenness and greed and won't repent, people who live in violence and sin and won't repent, he said, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. And it's interesting that throughout the New Testament, we are called to a pattern of good deeds. Matthew 5 tells us plainly that people should see, this is Yeshua teaching, they should see our good deeds and a result of that, praise our Father who's in heaven. You say, ah, that's talk, that's theory. Well, hang on. First, we're, we're, we're talking about core beliefs, aren't we? And, and, I, and I'm setting the record straight that Christianity does not simply say, well, you just say this prayer and believe. No, no. It is recognizing your sin, recognizing that we fall short, recognizing our human hopelessness, recognizing that God sent His Son to be our Savior, to be Messiah, to take the sins and guilt of the world. And when we put our trust in Him, we're saying, I can't save myself. I'm looking to you, God, to save me from my sins, to have mercy on me and to change me. And when He does that, we become new people. The, the new covenant is now written in our heart, and now we live to do the will of God. Paul says in Ephesians, the second chapter, that, that, that we were foreordained to, to, to do good works. Throughout his letters, he talks about a pattern of good works. You say, yeah, 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 but that's still talk. No, it's not talk. It's lived out. Go around the world and, and see who's built most of the hospitals. Go around the world in, into rural, unreached areas and see as the schools begin to come up, who's building most of the schools? Go when there's a calamity somewhere, when, when, when there's a disaster, an earthquake, tsunami, famine, and, and see who's there leading the way. Oh yeah, you'll have some Jewish organizations there and, and Israelis are strong in that. You'll have some other organizations that are non-faith, but the vast, vast majority of them will be Christians. Why? Because this is what followers of Jesus Yeshua do. So the, this whole false dichotomy, that Judaism is the religion of the deed, Christianity the religion of the creed, it's an exaggerated statement. It also has the wrong notion that I can work hard enough and do enough that with my repentance and good deeds I can somehow be accepted before God. That's where the message of Messiah the Messianic Jewish message says, no, 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 we all fall short and the only possible way for salvation is to cry out for mercy. Based on that mercy, we are now empowered to live a new life and that is the true power of tshuva and that is the true power of Messiah's blood. When we come back, 
we will continue talking about major theological objections to Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Thanks so much for watching the broadcast. One of our viewers recently communicated to me, there's nothing more important that you can be doing. And you know, we hear from Jewish people through our materials, they've come to faith in Jesus, Yeshua. Others had fallen away and they've come back to the Lord. Christians tell us they're now equipped to reach Jewish people with the gospel. And we, we have amazing open doors before us to reach more and more Jewish people than ever before. But we need your help. Everything we do is a team effort. Would you join together with us and become part of our team? Go to my website right now, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Click on the support banner, the TV support banner, and join us. And for your gift, of any size, I, I want to send you this book. I'm going to sign it for you. It's an exclusive hardcover edition of my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, which was written and published in a miraculous 10 weeks time. I'll send it to you for your gift of any size. Go to askdrbrown.org, click on the TV support banner, become a monthly supporter, help us with a one-time gift, and friend, be assured that together we're making a difference in the salvation of Israel. Please visit our website or call and ask how you can receive access to our countless free resources. Learn exciting information on what is happening around the world and with our ministry today. When you visit our website, be sure to check out our bookstore for the latest videos, books, and more. You may want to join us during an upcoming radio broadcast. Please contact us today for more information. Please remember, this ministry depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. Well, thank you for tuning in this week. I, I really hope that you were edified, that your eyes were open, that your faith was built. Look, let's face it. Our Jewish friends have some serious theological questions about faith in Jesus, whether it's, we can't believe that a man is a God, or don't you Christians believe in three gods, or whether it's the whole atonement system and blood sacrifice, and we don't need the blood of a man. So that's what we're tackling these weeks on answering your toughest questions. I wanna encourage you to join me week by week because we're gonna keep unfolding these objections, going deeper into scriptures and Jewish tradition. If you missed any broadcast, just go to my website, askdrbrown.org. You can catch up on all the, the broadcasts there. And if you're a Jewish person watching and you've got questions, please let us know. We'd love to help you. Ask drbrown.org and make sure to tune into next week's episode as we continue to tackle theological objections to the faith. This has been a paid program made possible by financial contributions to Ask Dr. Brown Ministries from viewers like you in your area. Thank you for your support.